This is Behind the Headlines with behind-the-scenes analysis on issues affecting Pennsylvanians, sponsored by the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy. Now, here's your host. From Erie to Philadelphia, from Wilkes-Barre Scranton to Pittsburgh, this is Behind the Headlines, the number one public affairs television program in Pennsylvania. We are seeing more widely than any other show across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We're happy to have you join us today, and I'm joined by my colleague and co-host, Mara Donnelly. Mara, welcome. Hello, Charlie. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you, too. Why, uh, we're going to talk about uh, one of the most important industries in Pennsylvania and in Pennsylvania's history today, and that is coal. Yeah. And uh, you come from western Pennsylvania. I do. Yeah. You have a coal tradition out there. Uh, apparently I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping that Mara will, uh, will uh, have some questions that I haven't thought of. I'm sure she will. Uh, today we're very fortunate to have with us the president of the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance, Mr. George Ellis. Mr. Ellis, so, welcome to the thank show. You. Hi, George. It's really nice to have you here. My pleasure. Um, thank you for inviting me. Oh, you're quite welcome. We were wondering if you could uh, start out by sharing with our viewers uh, a little bit about the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance. Uh, what is it? When did it start? Why did it start? Um, so forth. Give us well, give, the, get us started. The the uh, the coal the coal lines actually had its genesis back in the 70s. In there were two separate associations: the Pennsylvania. Coal Association and the Keystone Bituminous Coal Association. They merged in the 80s, and um, then in um, about a year year ago, we we merged again with uh, uh, a group out in Western Pennsylvania. Our reason for being, our mission is basically to advocate uh, for coal use, coal promotion uh, in in an, in an environmentally sound manner. But we are basically the uh, principal trade organization uh, uh, lobbying on behalf of the uh, bituminous coal operators and um, most of the uh, service uh, companies that service the industry. Well, Pennsylvania has had a long, long history with coal, and, and you indicated earlier that you don't go back all the way <laughs> with the coal, but tell us a little bit about the, um, the role and the importance that coal has played in Pennsylvania. Well, I, you know, Pennsylvania has kind of been the uh, uh, bellwether state in terms of uh, uh, the the, the uh, making the industrial re re powering the industrial revolution, uh, helping us win two world wars. Uh, That's pretty big. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, we have uh, um, we've we've uh, basically today we're our our major markets are the uh, generation of electricity. We do some um, uh, exporting to uh, uh, Europe and the uh, Pacific Rim countries. But, you know, we've been in Pennsylvania for over 200 years. We've been the, uh, the backbone in terms of powering our economy and uh, we're still a major force. We still account for, for example, 42 percent of the electricity generated in Pennsylvania today. So. Wow, that's pretty significant. So losing coal in Pennsylvania would have a major impact on our energy resources. A uh, compelling yeah. argument could be made that without coal, Pennsylvanians won't have, wouldn't have a, uh, an affordable, reliable supply of electricity. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now we see um, in Washington, D.C., and we hear in Washington, D.C., a lot of talk, a lot of movement uh, for the administration for President Obama's carbon reduction initiative. Uh, this, from what I understand, would result in the closure over the next few months of over 225 coal-generated, um, coal-powered electric generating stations. Um, I, if my numbers are approximately correct, the United States as a whole depends on coal for electricity to the uh, tune of about 48 to 49 percent yes. of all our electricity comes from coal. Uh, to me, this seems like um, this seems like we're heading for disaster because what's going to replace it? Uh, I'm not sure. Obviously, we don't have enough <coughs> windmills, uh, and windmills don't generate enough power to replace all this. Right. Doesn't the president understand we have clean coal technology, burning technology now? I wouldn't presume to uh, to speak for the president, <laughs> but I can talk about his policies, and his policies uh, absolutely make no sense. Um, one of the brightest spots of our economy 
has been our energy, our energy potential, our homegrown energy potential, just to bring it a little closer to home. 97% of our electricity, I said 42% came from coal, 97% comes from homegrown sources. Coal, natural gas, and nuclear power. So we have a template here that would provide not only for uh, uh, economic prosperity, but also for energy security. Mm -hmm. um, rather than maintaining that or promoting that formula, what we're, what, what the, and, and this is a regulatory proposal. This isn't a statutory or, or a legislative change. What the uh, Obama administration is trying to do is do it by regulations because they don't have the votes to do it uh, Legislative, legislatively. Yeah. And <coughs> what they're, what basically they're saying, and it makes no sense to us, is the most affordable, the most reliable source of electricity we're going to take out of the generation mix. Okay, we're just going to jettison from, 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 from the mix. We're not going to allow it to, uh, to be burned again. Absolutely I absurd. It's, it's crazy. Um, the, the new source performance standards on, on new uh, coal-fired power plants that you, you refer to, the, the new proposal, uh, would caps, cap emissions uh, of uh, uh, greenhouse gases uh, by 1,000 pounds per megawatt hour. It's a very stringent standard, so, stand, so stringent that the only way it could be met is by um, installation of technology, uh, carbon capture and storage, mm -hmm. that is not commercially proven and not commercially oh. available. And very so, likely expensive. Oh, if it was yeah. available, it'd be cost prohibitive. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. that's right. But it's a, it's a nice way of saying we don't want coal yeah. or, or a disingenu disingenuous way of saying no more coal without coming out and saying no more coal because basically what it does is bans the construct construction of new coal-fired power plants. Now, we're expecting a double, double whammy from this administration because uh, based on what the president said in its climate change address uh, over the summer was that he was also going to impose these onerous uh, regulatory standards on existing coal-fired power plants. Oh. That's what's going to precipitate, or I'm sorry, uh, that, that, that's what's going to uh, precipitate, yeah, the, the premature closing of, of existing coal-fired power plants. And we're, we're also seeing it today. In Pennsylvania, we've had eight power plants, uh, coal-fired power plants, that have already uh, announced that they would be prematurely uh, mothballed, retired. Mm. Okay. Well, Mara, if the president wants to do this through regulation, and but he doesn't have the votes to do it, can't the Congress, can't legislatures? The legislature, the Congress in this instance, can override well, they these. They can be proactive. Can't they? Yeah, sure, oh. absolutely. What, what, um, what exactly is your um, alliance doing to combat <coughs> these attacks? Well, we're, we're, we're trying, we, we have become more public. Okay, um, and we are meeting. We have uh, kind of formed a coalition with the different state coal associations, our national coal mining, so the national mining association, and we have to get the message out. And our our message is simple, more. It's look, you take coal out of the mix, you're going to increase utility rates. You're going to, and, and, and the people who are going to be hurt the most are the um, the poor people where the cost of energy mm -hmm. falls on, on, on disproportionately in our max manufacturing base. Mm -hmm. Now, we have slowly or steadily seen the evaporation of that manufacturing bank base leave. Oh, huge job loss with this, huge these changes. Total, yeah. big time job yeah. loss uh, because of the higher, higher rates, uh, higher utility rates. One of the, you know, one of the criteria that new businesses use to locate in Pennsylvania is, is, is the utility climate. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. had, we've mm -hmm. always been able to provide that stable, reliable, affordable uh, price for, for uh, electricity. You take 42% of that out of the mix. Right. Yeah, like you said before, Charlie, where are we going? Mm -hmm. We don't know where we're going. Well, we're certainly going, going to see skyrocket uh, rates.
Yeah. So, so it isn't even just the jobs that would be lost by coal. the coal itself. There would be a trickle-down effect coal. to other industries yes. leaving because of the cost it, of it. It would have a, a, a direct causal effect on the, on the increase of electricity. There's no doubt about it. Okay. okay. Could you talk about if this would go through, what the uh, specific impact, uh, George, would be on Pennsylvania uh, in terms of jobs, um, in terms of the economy and so forth. Could you give us or give our viewers some more specific uh, well, figures? Let me let me let me put it to you this way, Charlie. Uh, a lot of people don't 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 uh, particularly uh, east of the Susquehanna don't realize that the coal industry is still a major player in Pennsylvania. We're the fourth largest coal producing state. We mine about 68 million tons a year. Fourth right? largest coal producing largest. Sl state in America. Right. We uh, directly and indirectly. Uh, employ over 41,000 uh, people. Mm -hmm. our, our, our average wage exceeds $75,000 a year. That's okay, a good so, job. Right. So what, what you're talking about is, you know, a, a, our, our major customer is the electric utility industry. Mm -hmm. If if they start shutting down the plants, you know, you're talking about the you're talking about some really good paying jobs, okay? And 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 the and the ripple effect. Right. So, I mean, you can you can talk about maybe uh, 25 to 50 percent of of uh, of our 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 uh, our base being uh, displaced or or uh, or out of work. Uh, what would you, um, what are you, are you calling upon um, the, gov uh, the governor, the president, and perhaps even Congress to do uh, with this issue? Yeah, let me, let me, you, you mentioned governor first. Well, yeah, governor. Let me say the governor has been very uh, steadfast in his support of an uh, all-inclusive energy strategy, and we support him. We have, we have done the, the basic things, you know, we have written to written Congress. Letters, we have written made to some the phone governor, calls. right? <laughs> um, and uh, he, he, he uh, uh, you know, the, the president seems, for whatever reason, if it's trying to assuage his environmental base or whatever, seems very committed to uh, um, uh, imposing this moratorium on on the use of coal. I mean, there. Uh, and we've we've seen it in other areas in terms of trying to transfer transform. America's energy use away from coal. We've seen it in permitting with, uh, you know, very EPA has very been, been very aggressive in in um, in kind of over what, what it, it used to oversee our, our water permits. Now it's it's becoming more of a, a, a permitting agency. Mm -hmm. Okay, George, we, we thank you very much for okay. coming here. Unfortunately, we've run I, out of I time. Apologize. There I is get, more no. material to talk about than there is time. Right. And Amara and I are very happy to have you here, and we're looking forward to having you back. Mm -hmm. So we're going to the second segment of Behind the Headlines. Amara and I will be right back with that in a second. Behind the Headlines is brought to you as a public service by the Pennsylvania Business Council, envisioning a commonwealth in which residents enjoy a very high quality of life in sustainable communities. The council works aggressively to define key long-term policy strategies and solutions that make the commonwealth more competitive, creating and sustaining a better Pennsylvania. Additional underwriting provided by the Worrell Corporation Foundation, based in Carlisle, Pennsylvania by the Edward H. and Jeannie Arnold Foundation, and by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Behind the Headlines is also supported as a public service by Daily Underwriters of America, a better way for truck insurance. And by Penn Waste, your best local choice for your waste removal and recycling needs. Penn Waste is proud to be a locally owned business. Since the company's founding in 2000, it has employed many of its neighbors as members of a dedicated team of professionals. Penn Waste is proud of its many contributions to the people of its service area through support of numerous community organizations such as Christmas Addicts and the Junior League of York. One more way they improve the quality of life where they live and work. Behind the Headlines is a production of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, a nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization helping Pennsylvania build a brighter future.
welcome back to the second segment of Behind the Headlines. On this segment, Mara and I are fortunate enough to have an expert on Pennsylvania's judicial system. Pennsylvania's judicial system has been mm, being examined and being debated for many, many years, actually for many decades. I'm fortunate enough in that Mora is an attorney. Yeah. So you are a first hand you know, you have first hand knowledge yes. of this of this system. Yes. Yes. I think that there's uh, there is some confusion uh, at times about our, our um, structure, our structure. So maybe we can start with that with our guests. Okay. Well, we're very fortunate enough to have with us today Vic Stabile. Victor Stabile? Yes, pleasure. Uh, who nice is to be here. an attorney at law for Dilworth Paxson. And uh, you have had a lifetime of experience in Pennsylvania's judicial system. Well, so far, yes. My <laughs> lifetime's not over yet. <laughs> well, okay. one of the first questions that one hears about Pennsylvania's judicial system is, should we have a merit selection system, or should we elect judge, or should we have something like the Missouri system, a combination? Um, do you think there's a need to change in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Vic? If I can answer the question this way, uh, ultimately the objective is to get the best qualified person, both in terms of experience, but also character. And character, I think, is important because that's what affects the system and the person's ability to do the job admirably, I think, uh, ultimately. There is no silver bullet in the selection of judges. Uh, I've heard the debates on merit selection and election of judges, and they both have their pros and cons. You'll talk to judges who have gone through the election system, and they will tell you, if I had to go through merit selection, I would never be a judge today. Uh, so the election system, which by the way was passed by a very narrow margin in the 1968 Pennsylvania Constitution Convention, it was uh, debated heavily and uh, the election of judges I understand was narrowly passed as the system preferred by Pennsylvania. When you move over to merit selection, uh, you don't have the baggage of campaigning and the associated political issues that go with that. And merit selection, and I have served on merit selection panels, mm -hmm. uh, are good at winnowing down the field to a short list, how it's referred to, of qualified candidates. Unfortunately, the perception a good number of times is that within that short list is always a political favorite. That person always seems to get into mm -hmm. the short list. And uh, one person uh, who, you know, uh, I will not name was very candid about it. They said, you know what, we, we, we get the short list, and after that point, it's all political. So, you know, it's, that is probably the downside of the merit selection system. I served on a panel once, and there was a gentleman who was a judge that I thought was eminently qualified, but he did what he was supposed to do as a judge. He stayed out of politics. Uh, he was an excellent judge, very well regarded, but ultimately, he did not have the you know, political muscle at the end of the day to overcome other people, who, by the way, were qualified. But you know, that seems to be how merit selection goes sometimes. On the other hand, you know, merit selection does produce some very fine individuals the same way as the election system does. So I guess it depends who you talk to, but at the end of the day, uh, judge the system based upon the quality of the individual. There are a lot of very smart individuals uh, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that practice law that can serve as judges, would have no problem handling the work as a judge. I think character, however, uh, is the paramount issue, and I do believe that ultimately the best judges are those that have a deep abiding sense of humility. And I think a lot of that only comes with experience. Okay. As a judge, you need to understand where well, people have been. Give us a little bit of your background uh, with Dilworth. I know you, you've, uh, you know, we said you've have a, had a lifetime, but what's that lifetime been? Sure, <laughs> okay, well, let me back up. I said that a little tongue in cheek. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I'm a graduate of Dickinson Law School. I was a member of the Law Review over there and president of the student bar. And when I graduated, I was honored to serve an appellate judicial clerkship. Uh, when I finished that, I was appointed. And who did, who did you serve with? I served with uh, former justice and judge uh, Alexander Barbieri. He was mm -hmm. one of the first, he was a common pleas judge, one of the first appointed judges to the Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania, one of our appellate courts. He was a Supreme Court justice, and then he came back to the Commonwealth Court, which is where I met him in 1982. And as an appellate clerk, you know, you research and draft opinions uh, for the judge under uh, the judge's direction. 
when I left, I was always interested in trial work. I enjoyed appellate work as well, uh, had a, having had a bird's eye view of it. And uh, I was appointed to Deputy Attorney General under then uh, First Attorney General, elected First Attorney General, Roy Zimmerman. And uh, I remember walking in the first day and uh, I was, you know, all ready to go and they congratulated me and showed me my office and gave me my badge and uh, showed me 70 cases and they said, let us know if you have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> have fun. <laughs> it was a fantastic experience. Uh, I got to try some of the largest cases in the office by the time I was done. I actually had charge of the statewide trial unit by the time I left the Attorney General's office. It was invaluable experience, especially for a young lawyer. Well, in 1987, Bob Casey uh, was elected governor, and he managed the Harrisburg office of Dilworth Paxson. And some friends of mine were with the firm and invited me to come on board. So I joined Dilworth in 1987, became a partner in 92, where I've been uh, ever since. And the Dilworth firm is a collection of all kinds of individuals. I was told two things. You just have to be an excellent lawyer, and when things get tough, just work harder. <laughs> so that's good, sort of where I've good been. Good mission for a, for a law firm. Yes. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a, uh, I'm a geek, uh, I'll admit it. She's but also an attorney. I am, but, I, but I'm, I'm okay. probably more so a geek than I, than I full am. Disclosure. Uh, <laughs> full disclosure, full um, disclosure. What, what do you think the court systems ought to do to, to use technology to improve processes and perhaps cut expenses? I have experience managing other organizations. I have not been inside the court's uh, internal processes for some time, even though I regularly appear before them. As a practitioner, though, both in the appellate courts and the trial courts, the use of technology is increasing. You're seeing more courts going to submit, uh, you having submit your materials on disks so they can be scanned. I was at a bench bar conference. That saves time, I bet. <laughs> it does, but someone still has to read it. Yeah. Right. And I was at a bench bar conference talking to one of our circuit court judges, and I said, I heard you have four screens on your desk. He says, well, I only have three now, four is too many. But, you know, it makes uh, the amassing of information a lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, but you still have to have the ability to digest all of that. And as a judge, you need to carefully digest that because there are subtle points that make significant differences, not only in that case, but in people's lives. Mm -hmm. uh, look, it's a freight train coming at us. That's where the world is going. The judiciary, like any other business uh, or practice, is going to be moving in that direction. What you don't want to see is that the human element gets lost to technology. At the end of the day, the cases judges decide affect human beings, mm -hmm. real lives. And you cannot lose sight of that fact, in my opinion. One of the arguments that one has heard over the years uh, about why Pennsylvania's judiciary uh, has not been perhaps of the quality that uh, the people of the Commonwealth had hoped for was that the low salaries, in fact, this ignited the whole legislative pay increase uh, brouhaha several years ago when Chief Justice Ralph Cappy uh, went to Governor Rendell and said, we are not paid enough. And, uh, and Governor Rendell said, nor are my cabinet members. Sure. And then they went with the legislative leaders and they said, well, we aren't paid enough either. And they all <laughs> gave themselves a pay increase. But certainly, uh, it turned out, I believe, that the pay increase stood for the judges. And yeah. uh, there was a thinking that the salaries for judges in Pennsylvania was so low that a good attorney could make far more money in private practice. Yeah. Why would you even want to run for the bench? Are salaries in Pennsylvania high enough now to attract qualified, um, qualified and interested um, uh, nominees uh, or applicants, I should say, for the, uh, for the bench? I certainly think if you ask uh, any member of the general public, they will tell you yes the salaries are high enough for judges. Can you do better in private practice if you're a qualified uh, and bright attorney? Yes, you can. But uh, are the salaries so low that they discourage great numbers of people from running for the bench? I don't think so. It certainly has the effect, I think, of discouraging some of the best talent from running for the bench if you look at it purely from an economic perspective. On the other hand, uh, I can't take a lot of issue with it. Somebody who runs for judge should not be motivated solely by the economic benefits of that office. In my opinion, you want somebody who wants to be a judge as an advocation because of the role the judiciary plays in our system of government and because they are committed to being a part of that and passing the torch and seeing that the judicial system works for everyone. 
So if you have somebody who's motivated that way, you have to pay them fairly. We all have families and, and obligations to support. But uh, I don't think you need to have the highest paid people being judges. Uh, you know, I think you need to pay them well enough uh, to take care of them, to respect them for the qualifications that they have and the commitment that they make. But uh, you need someone who views this as an advocation, principally on what the judiciary is supposed to do to serve the public. Good. Well, I understand that you're involved in a lot of com community work. You want to tell us a little bit about I some have of that been. Work? Yes. Something about the ballet. <laughs> 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 I have I actually. Uh, I've been involved in community and pro bono work for quite some time. Uh, I started out, oh, I want to say in the in the 80s, uh, doing community work, uh, representing citizens and, and citizens groups and, and, and local issues, and that one thing le led to another. Uh, I do do a fair amount of pro bono work. Uh, I am the general counsel to the Central Pennsylvania Youth Ballet, uh, who likes to say they change lives through dance. And uh, I'm proud of that because when you, you see these kids, they come from, you know, the youngest, you know, right, th right through high school. The discipline and the work ethic and the athleticism that the school builds into those kids is phenomenal. And, uh, you know, I like donating my time to causes like that. On the other hand, I have over the years always liked the opportunity to defend individual rights. I defended a, a well, I went to court for an Air Force widow once who lost her husband in Desert Shield. The government went to her and said, we're sorry for your loss. Oh, by the way, we can't pay you the rest of your husband's money. He didn't finish his time with us. Hmm. It was an outrageous case. I spent over three years on that pro bono. At the end of the day, we secured benefits. So, so some I've, attorneys still have time to do some pro bono work. Yes, a lot good, of us do. Good, good, it's, good to hear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I principally think that the role of the legal profession is to protect individual rights. Well, we want to thank you very much for coming here today and talking uh, with Mar and myself and our viewers. And uh, we uh, look forward to having you back maybe to talk some more about uh, the judicial system in Pennsylvania and uh, how we might uh, improve it in the future. We'll okay. be back again next week with a new edition of Behind the Headlines. Mar and I look forward to seeing you then. Production of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy, a nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization helping Pennsylvania build a brighter future.